just introducing the candidates. So yeah. let's take a listen. Yep. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our first press conference uh, as a tandem. Uh, and since we made the announcement of, of both myself, I haven't actually had a chance to engage with, with all of you uh, since, you know, my nomination in, sorry, in November. And I'm so excited to be running with Leila with the Democratic ticket for governor and Senate governors. Welcome, and, and uh, let's open up the questions. If, if elected governor will be the first woman governor in human history, right? So my question is, who will be the first gender one? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a great question, Ferdy. <laughs> I'm going to put out a request for proposals. <laughs> 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 He told me he probably won't wear a tie for me, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> Island print will work. <laughs> Uh, candidates uh, Sablan and Staffler, I just did want to ask you uh, uh, what what the next few weeks look like for you. What is the road ahead? What are some of the next steps you'll be taking after this announcement? I know you're going to have your kickoff in just a few days. That's right. The kickoff is on Wednesday. The public is invited. It, the, we'll start with the roadside waving at the Garapan Fishing Base, and the program itself will start at 4 so we wanted to uh, extend the invitation uh, today and, and invite everyone to come on down. Uh, and after the roadside kickoff, um, after the roadside waving and the kickoff event, we will be uh, convening our committee, electing officers for the, the committee to elect, uh, Christina Sablan and Leila Staffler. And, uh, and then we expect to be uh, beginning our, our campaign with the house to house visits and, um, and a lot of education about what we stand for, the platform that we'll be rolling out. So the Democratic Party does have a platform that uh, Leila and I worked very closely with our colleagues to, to develop and, and was adopted in 2020. We are in the process now of updating and expanding that platform. And we're looking forward to sharing that vision with the community and, and getting to that. And what does the Sablon Staffler ticket offer that the Palacios Apatang and Torres Sablon ticket does not offer? Um, we are a, we are, we're both, I would say, fresh faces in, in government and leadership. Um, and I, um, you know, that this ticket is historic in, in many ways. Um, first time that, that two women are running together for the top leadership positions in office. Uh, we both bring uh, experience, a record of, of championing good governance in the Commonwealth for the last 15 years together as well as in, in our separate capacities. I have a planning background. Layla has 20 years of experience in public education. And um, the Sublime Staffler administration will put education, healthcare, and, and infrastructure development uh, front and center in, in, our, in our platform. Um, and, and then in, in, in the program that we'll be moving out. So, did you want to add to that? Well, um, I guess I just want to uh, include that uh, with respect to our backgrounds, you know, we have had a lot of um, personal, you know, path, career pathways that we've explored, but we've also done a lot of community organizing together. And part of the next steps forward that we really want to um, focus on are making sure that we get the input of our community on the priorities and things that we need to make sure we keep in mind going ahead because um, change is a is a big step. And when you're managing change, it really helps get your community buy-in. Uh, because it will affect everybody and it is something that is really exciting and uh, making uh, a lot of people think about the possibilities of what could be um, for our commonwealth. I mean, good governance is something that she, uh, Ms. Tina Sablan, has always um, championed. It's the reason why I have always followed her career. It's the reason why I even decided to take this uh, step towards public service. I mean, I've been in education. Education is a stable uh, it's a stable place to work, you know, but I see that I would like to help my community in other ways. And so that's part of why I decided to follow uh, Tina in this, this area. It's, it's really important that we have leaders who are willing to step out. And so here we are. And if I could just ask uh, just a uh, last question before passing it on, uh, 
have lots of questions for you both, but uh, did want to ask, you both voted yes for the impeachment of Governor Ralph Torres. There are some say that, uh, you know, it's so division uh, that uh, we're more polarized than ever. Uh, the governor himself said that it was driven partially by hatred. Uh, what's your message heading into this election uh, as both uh, ca uh, as part of a historic ticket, uh, but also in a time where it is uh, an impeachment did happen that you voted for? What is your message to the community and those who say that uh, it's so division? Well, I'd say that what we're offering is a positive vision of the path forward. Um, we, in, 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 in terms of our roles as legislators and um, in reviewing the documents, reviewing the evidence, listening to the testimonies that, that came out during the JGO investigations, we were doing our jobs. Um, and these are jobs that Leila and I take very seriously as, as do our colleagues. Um, we looked at the facts. Uh, we listened to the testimonies of witnesses and folks, and and you know I would note uh, it, it it was really a bipartisan vote. I mean, it was Democrats, Independents, and Republicans that uh, eventually, over the course of this investigation, the last two years, came to the conclusion that Governor Torres's conduct rose to the level of impeachment. And and so now that that vote um, has been. It's done. Uh, it's the the, um, the trial now sits with the Senate, uh, and Leila and I are, are ready to move forward with presenting uh, our vision of, of what government could and should be like. So, what you know, we talk about good governance. What does that mean? It means fairness. It means honesty. It means fiscal responsibility. Um, it, it means you know, in a lot of ways, like like everything that we learned in, in these last two years during the during the JJO investigation, but also even before that with the special committee, um, it, we were looking at all kinds of examples of how not to run a government, how not to take care of public funds, and also you know, how, how not to take care of the people who work in government. Um, and, and so we are presenting a, a much different and more positive vision of, of what leadership in government should be. Um, you know, and, and what I, I'd like to add to that is you know we, we we've talked a lot about ending this 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 culture of, of political intimidation in government. Uh, Layla is a champion of the Whistleblower Protection Act. I'm a co-sponsor along with with other um, with other colleagues in, in the House. And in a lot of ways, that is a response to the culture that we see now and that we hear about all the time from government employees who are afraid to speak up, afraid to you know just exercise their First Amendment rights. Um, because, because retaliation is real, and that needs to stop. That is happening in this administration right now, and it needs to stop. Yes, um, the whistleblower protection uh, uh, bill is really important to me, just knowing so many different people that have come out to me, friends, people I never even met, who wanted to share their experience of uh, political intimidation or, or being transferred to a lower position or just you know, doing something that just seems so illogical because if you're performing your job and you're doing what you're supposed to do, which is providing the services to our people or protecting the, our, our community coffers or, you know, that type of, of work and, and they're being penalized for doing the right thing. Um, for us, as much as it's uh, contrary to the way people believe politics is, it's it's actually possible um, to, to run a government that that is focused on being transparent, on being open, and, and making sure that services that people get are the best services they can, because if people are not afraid to do their jobs and focus on what they have to focus, uh, we can do so much. And so uh, the whistleblower protection bill is something that we will continue to pursue. It's in committee right now, and um, we hope to get it to the Senate so that we can continue to try and give our people these assurances that the, the way that we will operate are the principles that we stand by and, and the whistleblower protection is a huge piece of that. Um, and so I, I hope that if you haven't read it, it is online on the website um, on cnmileg.net. Uh, it's in the house section, please check it out. And we can send copies if, if you need. Yes. I have a question for um, Ms. Buckner. So, you know, some may say that you are still very new to politics. This is your first term in the House of Representatives. You have you've had a career in education, um, and you're now you're running for lieutenant governor. What is your response to those who may say that you know you're still very new to the system? 
That is true. I may be new to this system, but one thing that I can tell you is that I have a lot of experience with systems. I feel like systems are my passion. Um, one of the things that I've always been really good at is getting people to work together to a common goal. And I believe one of the main reasons that I wanted to do this work is that I felt our government could do better at collaborating with each other to provide the services that, you know, the common goal of providing services to our people. And um, I feel with the right leadership, you know, it always comes from the top, your culture, your work culture, your school culture, it comes from the top. And, and what you, how you operate, the principles that you, you believe in, the principles that guide you are the things that will change the way an operation or system works. The things that we believe in, the principles that guide us are good governance principles. These are things that can change systems, the culture of systems. It's never easy. That's another thing that I bring to the table. I've had extensive training in change, helping people manage change. First order change is easy to deal with. Second order change, you need supports. And so with the, the steps ahead that we'll be making, um, we will always keep that in mind because um, although people want change, we also need to make sure that the change that comes is something that has community buy-in, that, that people can, can see the vision of and have that common goal. And so although I might not have as much experience in those halls, I've had a lot of experience in other halls. And all of that is dealing with people, relationships, how you communicate, how you treat people, how you, how you uh, bring ideas that, that uh, represent all. And so um, I don't think you need years and years of experience in a certain system. If you have experience in multiple systems, you can use them anywhere. You know, speaking of change and culture, um, we've seen women, you know, become leaders in other nations, but here in the scene of mine, you know, we're very in, still intact in our culture. And I guess it's, uh, it's safe to say that we're used to men leading the way. Now, this is very historic. We have two women running for, you know, the top positions and um, to lead the island. But what would, you know, like, I guess, what would be your message to those who won't take this, you know, um, <laughs> this appearance as women leading. Yes. <laughs> yes, there's some second argument. <laughs> you know, because the culture, we're very used to men leading the way. Well, I guess I'd like to, you know, counter that with we, our original culture was a matrilineal culture. And so women had leadership and always have had leadership in the home. Uh, and when, you know, uh, people think about leading the home, that's, that's so many different systems also. And so um, I think that uh, times have changed, you know, we are in a very different society, although uh, our, our original cultures actually did uh, celebrate women leadership. And, and so I think that uh, maybe it's Western lead cultures that have maybe integrated that have changed what was originally. So that's my thought. <laughs> yeah, I would say too that, you know, like history has also shown that when women here and, and in other places, but, but just talking about the CNMI, when women here do run for office, um, they are very electable. And when we had more women running for the for seats in the legislature than ever before last year, a lot of those women were elected and are now sitting in the House and the Senate. We've got Senator Edith now in the House and the Senate. Um, and so, you know, I think what, what is key is, is encouraging women to run. Because, you know, what, what I can tell you is that uh, the feedback that, that we've both gotten ever since my announcement came out and then Leila's as, as the lieutenant governor has been overwhelmingly positive from women and men and, and children and elderly. And, and so I think it, like I've been so appreciative of how, how embracing um, our community has been. And so I think the key is, is, is putting that option on the ballot, right? You, I mean, you never really know if a community is ready for change until the choice is actually given to them to, to make. And, um, and, I, and I think people are, I think people are ready to see women in the top leadership positions of government. Awesome. Hillary, this weekend said you both possess the character and moral compass to lead. Are there questions of immorality and questionable character in your lives or in your past that you'd like to address right off the week? I really can't think of anything. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a very direct question. I mean, I would say that no one is perfect and what certain people might um, interpret and their perception as, you know, there's a lot of different interpretations on, on moral character. 
But I would say that as a person, both people who have often focused on serving our communities, um, that's usually the type of character that we've often you know, presented. Um, I would say that I, as a school leader, one of the things I would always talk about is character counts. You know, how you treat people, the res mutual respect that you give, the um, caring and showing kindness, and just all of those different uh, leadership qualities are, are what we bring to the table. And so as far as moral character, I mean, like, I, I can't think of anything that would come to mind except you know, people have different interpretations. I, I know what's always been really important to Layla and me. Uh, you know, we've been we've been we've known each other for like 15 years, and and actually first got to know each other while working on a good governance campaign, uh, right? To reapply the open government act to the legislature, to do all these public forums in the community, and and and, and I know that what's important for both of us is is being able and committed to doing the right thing, even when no one is. And I, I've heard her say it, it's very near and dear to my heart, um, and, and that is how we do it. Are there issues of morality and character you believe the other teams should address? Um, I think that is up to the other teams to address. Are there any values or tenets of the Republican Party you value and will bring with you to the governor's office if elected? I, I, th I, want, I do want to say that what is often uh, billed as a Republican uh, tenant, I guess, is, 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 is actually, I, I don't see it as Republican, I don't even see it necessarily as a Democrat, um, but what is important to both of us is fiscal responsibility. And Layla and I are both very, very conscientious of how we spend the funds. Uh, I think that that principle has been distorted and corrupted with the current administration. Um, just being very, very candid about that, uh, and, and but it's 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 not it's it's been most typically uh, characterized as a Republican principle, um, but I see it as Democrat, bipartisan, nonpartisan, whatever. Fiscal responsibility is important to all of us, and it's important to Yes. What will you do to rid the Commonwealth of corruption? Please be specific. May I start? Yeah, please. I guess um, for me, the whistleblower protection says a lot to how we can um, um, combat uh, corruption. And that that is a bill that would become law that would protect people. So if it happened to them, they could have a place for recourse, like how to, you know, how to protect themselves. But I feel that with the administration, with us at the helm, people wouldn't even have to I mean, I would hope that they wouldn't be reporting, and if they were reporting, we would address those issues directly. Because if if our um, leadership or people in the government that work under our administration are doing those types of things, um, those are the that we would tolerate and would you know address resources way because that's one way of rooting out corruption is um, following the policies and, and roles that guide you. Um, fairly across the board, you know, so that any hiring practices are have equal opportunity, um, where any disciplinary practices are equal. Also, you know, if you if you are not performing, then you should have uh, something to talk about. But if you are performing, then there you shouldn't be penalized. And so, I guess for me, that is how I envision uh, rooting out corruption, uh, combating corruption in the actions that person. No, I, I agree completely, and I think so much is set at the top of leadership, right, in terms of the tone of government, and um, and and corruption also happens in, in different forms, right? And it could it could be something as as common, sadly, as the governor picking up the phone and telling uh, somebody in law enforcement, one of the regulatory agents, "Hey, uh, can you not enforce this law and give this guy a break?" That is corruption, right? And and I can tell you right here, right now. Governor Sablon and um, Lieutenant Governor Stafford will never do that. We will never tell a law enforcement agency not to enforce the law. We will never tell any government employee not to do their jobs. And, and moreover, there will not be retaliation or political intimidation for people who do, for people who want to do the right thing, people who want to report um, any unethical or illegal activities that they see. I mean, if anything, that, that should be encouraged so that we can deal with those problems. Nice. So, how are you going to spend the remainder of the federal funds coming downwards from when it's going to be elected? 
I, I think our very first step will be to lay out all our financial books and see what's left. I mean, quite frankly, I am very concerned about the fiscal condition of our government right now. Getting a clear picture of what that looks like has been enormously difficult. Uh, we're still trying to get the Secretary of Finance in to uh, provide a report of, of uh, not just all the federal funds, but all the senior money funds, because we're about shortfalls and of schools. Um, and and you know, I I think that will be you know day one. Our first step will be to get just the lay of the land and 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 see really what's left. <laughs> and you know, that half a billion dollars is a lot of money. There could be more coming in um, through build that does end up passing. Um, Congress and getting signed during during us from an office, um, and and so uh, you know as I said earlier, uh, building up our educational institutions, building up our healthcare system, and then and then our infrastructure. I mean it's it's 21st century, 2022, and the people of the CMI still don't have 24 hour drinkable water for the town, and something as basic as that, right? Um, infrastructure, our safe streets on all our islands, um, uh, wastewater systems on, on all our islands, uh, a sanitary, a solid waste management program for all our islands. Uh, that that actually would be possible with, with the windfall of money that we're seeing now, which is which is unprecedented and which we will probably never see again, right? And and so the urgency of, of using those funds wisely and planning for the future, not just for next year or four years from now, you know, when, when it's election time again, it's so, so. Okay, I have one more. Who's in you guys' campaign management team? Uh, we have a number of people. <laughs> 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 there, there's like a core committee and, and we're actually gathering, um, getting put the first time for us, for the right after. And so we'll be electing our, our chair um, and May I add to that, like, if you're interested in joining the cause, please reach out to us in social media or any way for it that you can, whether it's in email or, you know, Instagram or Facebook, whichever one you use. Um, but we'd love to encourage more people to come out and join. And we do understand because of the re political retaliation out there, people might be afraid. And so if you would like to participate in a different way, you know, we, we're looking to engage with as many people as possible. We want to have uh, anyone who's really excited about this to, to help in any way. Uh, please reach out. We'd love to have your, your support. And representatives, you. I just did have two questions for you uh, on that note. I did want to ask about your approach to fundraising and transparency. Are there particular parameters that you're going to set in place? Are you going to be reporting who your donors are? And again, asking this question based on your concerns that you've expressed with your uh, opponents. Right. Uh, yes, we will be. I mean, we're actually all candidates are required to report uh, their campaign contributions. But I think what set what has set uh, some of us apart, and, I, and what I'm committed to doing, is reporting our, our contributions, the donations that we receive. Um, before election time, <laughs> because right now, and this is something that actually we talked about changing in the law, is um, right now candidates only have to risk report after election, and we think it's really important for the sake of transparency for everybody to, to know, um, you know, who all your major donors are, right? And and I challenge the other teams to do the same. I believe uh, our chairwoman Nola is also sharing that we are required for, as a Democratic Party to. Um, follow the FEC uh, guidelines with respect to donations and all of that. And so um, the transparency has, you know, if we're following the internal controls that are provided by the, the systems that exist, then we are doing exactly what we're supposed to do. Yeah, I will say that we will do, be doing a lot of sort of grassroots uh, fundraising. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And <laughs> um, this is the party of the people. And, you know, even small donations, $5, $20, people who just want to join the cause. Uh, that made such a difference in, in you know in the Obama campaign and Bernie Sanders campaign and um, you know and, and so we welcome the, the the smaller donations too like every every little bit will help. And I did also want to ask about a a, a response to uh, that the NMA Democratic Party put out in response to a photo of Democrats on Rhoda endorsing Palacios Apatang. I know we received a response from uh, the president uh, from the chair herself uh, saying that. Uh, the Democratic Party of the NMI did not approve nor release any photos, press releases, banners, uh, basically saying uh, it was not, you know, officially 
uh, the stance of the Democratic Party. Uh, but I just wanted to get your response to that, uh, that uh, there are some Democrats, perhaps, who might not be supporting you based on uh, these photos and information we've received. What's your message to, to them and your response? Yeah, there, I mean, there's no hard feelings. I actually did reach out to some of the folks um, who were at that gathering and read the photo, and uh, you know, we, we remained friends. I, I, we actually, we, we all knew uh, that it was likely that, um, that for some of our Democrats on Rota, that because of the very close family ties that they may have with um, with the other teams, that 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 may affect their political um, choices, and and we respect that. That's, I mean, that that's probably not just going to be true for Rhoda, but for the other islands. And you know, and and by the same token, you know, we will have a Republican and independent family members who will, you know, probably align with us for similar reasons. Um, you know, and, and you know, people's political choices are their own for whatever their motivations might be. Um, there are still plenty of Democrats on Rhoda that will support us, uh, and you know, that's and we'll just keep campaigning and working hard to to earn the, um, the, the votes and the confidence of, of our people. I'd like to add that um, that's one of the things that is different about us as well, is we want to embrace all voters, whether you choose us or not, just vote. Your voice matters. Every voice matters. So, you know, exercising your First Amendment rights through your voting ballot is the most important thing that you can do. And so if you've never voted before, we encourage you to register and make your choice. Look at the the choices that you have and, and go with your heart, go with who you think will be the best choice for our community, for our islands. Um, we've met several people on our house to house visits that we've done just in the short little bit of time that we've had so far. And we've met several people um, who have shared that they will be registering for the first time ever in their lives. And so uh, they're excited because they have a choice they want to vote for for the first time. Um, and, and so I'm excited to have encourage that already in a few people and so through you i'd like to ask for more people maybe you've never voted maybe this is your year so please register if you need help let us know and uh just one last question before we have to sign off here on our end but uh, uh one thing that has yet to be mentioned too is that you are actually the first person from tinian to run for lieutenant governor you were just speaking about constituents on rota how important is tinian in this election and how uh do you plan on, uh, do you plan at all on, uh, you know, maybe having Tinian be more pronounced in your campaign and, uh, you know, uh, out, uh, constituents outside of Saipan? Well, um, I think all people on all of our islands are important. Um, I, I am a daughter of the Marianas and I'm a daughter of Tinian. Um, my first place that I went when I knew that this was happening was to go to talk to the Pilung and Saina of my families on Tinian. So I, I went there first with my announcement to share with my, my my most reverend family members so that they knew and wouldn't be blindsided by the news. I know I did not get to everyone, but my mom helped me. I'm so grateful um, because, <clears throat> sorry, it's very important. Respect in our culture is very important. <clears throat> and I just wanted to know that my family was aware um, because when you're called to serve, you must you must meet that call. And um, I know that there are many family members that I still have yet to reach out to. And please know that we are coming. Um, house to House is high up on our list of what we will be doing next. And so um, I, I know that there are many other family members to hit and, and just community. It's, it's everyone that we can try and reach out to to share this vision. Um, so Tinian is, is a big part of that. Rhoda is a huge part of that. We will be doing house to house on all three islands. Um, we have several months to, to get there, but we have a plan and we will be reaching out. And so um, I want to just thank you for, for, for sharing that fun fact. It is something that the Tinian people are very proud of. Um, I know that uh, there is a lot of amazing people that uh, come from Tinian and, and come from Rhoda and represent is that the island of Saipan, I mean, we as a Marianas people are very uh, talented and creative and, and, and worldly. And so we're just going to try and lift everyone up through the type of work that we do. That's that's our goal. Amen. We actually just came from Tinian. Uh, we were just there yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, and we're planning to go to Rhoda next week. And, you know, we're really hitting the ground running. And, and we will be, as Ayla said, on the phone here. Yeah. We have to organize. Uh, my next question is actually Leila or 
question is uh, what things that make you cry? <laughs> <laughs> Family. Family is strong. You know, it's important that um, I know that in this new election, I feel like I know that there's a lot of relationships that, you know, uh, friends, family, you know, where we're all, we're all deeply connected as people. And the one thing that every message that I got, especially from the elders was focus on the issues, focus on the issues. Let's try and keep this as positive and, you know, not a uh, mud thing as possible because what really matters is what we're going to perform at the end. And so uh, that, that makes me emotional because it's such an important part of, of these next steps that, that we have. And, and I would say also that this is um, this kind of you're being willing to put yourself. All right, that again, uh, live uh, coverage there, uh, Tomas Manglotnia, CNMI uh, correspondent of a Democratic Party press conference uh, with their uh, two uh, nominees for governor and lieutenant governor. Yes, that's right. So we just heard for the first time uh, those two candidates uh, speak to us uh, and, and uh, other island media uh, across uh, Saipan yep. talking about their vision for yeah. and uh, talking about their vision not just for Saipan but for Saipan, Tinian, Rhoda, the entire northern Mariana Islands. Uh, we were just expecting to interview uh, Rep. Layla Staffler today, but uh, we got the chance to uh, we got see them both. Uh, and uh, them address really, uh, you know, some of the pressing issues. Uh, they touched uh, all of the all, all of the ground, uh, and and uh, we'll continue to bring more of that coverage as more news out of the CNMI, uh, you know, occurs. Thank you, Tomasa. Uh, I did see uh, Rep. Uh, Layla getting a little bit emotional there, but I I kind of missed it. What was that about? Uh, well, uh, ev you know, everyone was talking about how historic the ticket is because there are two female candidates. Right. Uh, one of the facts that was left to be mentioned until I asked about it was that she's the first. Uh, candidate for lieutenant governor uh, from Tinian wow. and so she was saying that she got emotional because uh, one of the first places she went she said was to Tinian to ask uh, to ask uh, permission from her family and that's where she got misty eyed and choked up wow. about the process because uh, it has been a tumultuous year I, I don't think uh, you get an impeachment uh, during an election year every year so yeah, yeah I don't think uh, so 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 it is a different climate that they're doing this in. And again, it's a three-team race now. You have the Republicans, uh, Governor Torres, of course, with Senator Vinny Sablon. You have independent Republicans, Lieutenant Governor Arnold Palacios with right, Saipan right, Mayor David yeah. Apatang. And then you have these Democratic women who are going to uh, take charge in their party. I like how uh, they addressed um, the, inex or the, the experience that they do have, right, uh, in contrast with the other uh, candidate. And right, other and teams. some, uh, you know, uh, it was asked there by our uh, colleague at KSPN2, uh, Sally, who asked uh, Layla about her non-traditional experience, but, uh, you know, she turned that around and said 20 years as an educator is a uh, valuable experience in her yeah. view, and uh, that's something she'll bring to the table in what she was talking about, uh, you know, change or order of change, and... Uh, interesting too to see their response to the factions growing within the democratic party given that democrats on rota uh, are going to some of them at least are going to be uh, supporting the independent ticket and uh, it'll, it'll be interesting because a lot of people wondering if this is going to end up uh, in a runoff and uh, what what again, is the so what does it take to i believe the rule the, the rule is if no one gets uh, 50 percent plus one and it's looking <laughs> you know, and so uh, right. they're, they're going to, it's looking like we're going to end a three-way race, right? right? Yeah. Unless uh, overwhelmingly someone does secure that. Wow. Juicy. And it's just getting started. It's only January. Guys. And then we also are having an election here. I don't know if you heard, but there's an election <laughs> here. Uh, well, also, also speaking of, uh, of not just regional, but international elections, you know, like Ernesto Lacanto has been in the Philippines for several months now, and he'll be right. covering the, the Philippine election. He was actually telling me, I didn't realize this because, you know, there are several gubernatorial or presidential candidates like out there they have a true whoever has the most votes like wins format and you know i never understood the in saying the Philippines? Uh, you know yeah, it's not an electorate every every election is the election that matters oh, right yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but it seems that now even more than ever yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because of the because of the pandemic yeah. uh because of again just this uh really this war chest that uh, governors and different people have because of yeah. the federal funding. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's really Let a race to see who has, uh, you know, who gets to determine where that money goes. Right. And people are saying now, I mean, if you just put your ear to the papula vine, 
what they're saying is that uh, Governor Lou is unbeatable because she, exactly what you said, she has this war chest of, uh, and it's not intended to fund your reelection. It just, it is what it is. Um, but she has that war chest that her opponents clearly will not be able to match in any way, shape, or form. Is so, there, so are you anticipating? I'm just saying for Governor Torres, is there that same talk? Uh, oh, for sure. I mean, his his media team has grown from one to eight. Oh. You know, uh, now he has his own kind of press pool. Again, I'm not alleging that that's he's using it for re-election, but there are campaigns that are starting through the media team that you just wouldn't have seen before if the money oh, was yeah. not available. Well, so it's election, yeah. Right. And so, I mean, uh, you know, every message is political. I mean, and everything that happens in an election year will be looked at under the microscope. Right. And we're doing well, it here. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it. We'll hopefully we'll be it. able to get close enough to look under the microscope and not have to use our telescope. Right. I mean, like uh, tonight we'll have it on primetime. But, the, you know, the uh, uh, fiscal year report came out for the CNMI had, you know, they, they touched on it a bit. But, uh, you know, with all of this happening uh, and, uh, you know, the deficit continuing, it's it's a uh, lot. You know, we're always left with more questions. Yeah, so. definitely. Yeah. Uh, Ten oh four. Well, good thing it's our job to ask him, Tomas. Thank yes, you. Thank you. There you go, uh, Tomas Magloutnia. Jay, good job today. All right.